Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Tell me, what's the name of your dog? This is Wing Manji, aka Buddha. I call him Guruji because he's my guru. He's the highest form of life on the planet, my inspiration for everything that I do. He's the nectar of the universe, and he speaks with his kisses a lot. He's mm. got many languages, but kisses are one of my favorite languages that he uses to communicate everything. He wants to, he wants to table dance. He likes he table really dance. He really wants to say hello to me. I can he, tell. He can. You can say hi to Mama. Hello. My dog is shy right now. Yeah, he's trying to drink some coffee. He likes coffee. He loves some caffeine. He really does. He already had a matcha latte this morning. At, no way. Yeah. <laughs> he did. So I am so curious. How did you start voice acting? Like, how did that journey work out for you? Well, I've been an actor since I was a little boy. But then I got into prank calling. And I started to mess around with voices. And... Um, I, would, I started off actually really young, sitting in my father's lap, driving around the country and using a CB, um, like, which is a trucker thing, a trucker like CB radio, and I'd mess with truckers with voices. And my dad goes, one day you're going to do cartoons. Fast forward, now I've done you know thousands of cartoons. That's wild. Mm -hmm. um, so this is our first time ever meeting. Yeah. Uh, Ivy in my, these bodies in these exactly bodies. Ivy my great producer of this podcast said you would be the guy to interview and that's so fascinating to hear about your story about like prank phone calls and yeah. stuff yes I love being a jokester I think in the end <laughs> it's all a cosmic giggle so for me to bring comedy to the world through entertainment is one of my favorite things to do Mm, yeah, comedy. I love comedy. Mm. I recently went to the comedy store for the first time. Yeah. I'm kind of a newbie to LA. Yeah. I moved to LA in 2020. So I, I'm just so inspired by comedians. And I could see where you kind of pick up some comedic stuff, inspiration in your voiceover acting career. I can yeah. see that. It's fun. And all the and all the T V shows that I'm in, like the middle, all my live action shows, even Fast and Furious, the movie uh, Fast and Furious that I'm in. I, I am very much the comic relief a lot of the times in all the roles that I play. Um I'm actually about to step into the stand up world. I'm having my first stand up show soon. I've been working on my act. Actually a friend is she just ghost wrote my first five minutes because I just been having a hard time putting it together because there's so much that I want to say and do. I was like, please just help me write my first five minutes to get me going. Just five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you gonna do this I performance? Don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of options. Yeah, there's so many, especially yeah. in LA. Yeah. So when did you move to LA? I was 19 years old. I grew up in South Florida. Um, I I got my surfboard on my roof. My roof. And um, my, my dog in my passenger seat at the time, his name was Timber. He was an earlier version of Wing Manji. He's my best friend. And I drove to California. I knew one person. And um, I was going to go to school for directing at UCLA. And I wound up working as an actor immediately. And I just learned everything on set and never stopped learning. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So... Would you say that surfing was kind of like the catalyst for you, and also the acting? Surfing. Was that the big draw? The well, as a junior, pro as a junior professional surfer, being third in the U.S. at one point, Whoa. I had to choose between continuing down, like wanting to be a professional surfer, or getting into acting, directing, and making music, which I love a lot. And I figured I could surf the rest of rest of my life, but now is the time to go to California and get into the, the big time entertainment business because I've been in the entertainment business since I, was, since I was a little boy, but nothing like LA. Florida is not LA, nowhere's like LA. So I just I jumped in and it's, it's never stopped. Yeah, same for me too. It was just like hit the ground running mm -hmm. when you moved to LA. Even though like I moved during 2020 when everything was shut down. Yeah, but well, it was the best because I work in VR production, mm. and that's when like everything was really popping off again for yeah. virtual reality. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just LA. There's just so much opportunity here, and there is. 
it's endless. The people here, there's so many creatives. You throw a rock and you hit like an actor mm -hmm. or a director. And it, that's just so much fun. So yeah. when mm -hmm. did you start getting those voiceover acting gigs? Well, my first audition was for Teen Titans, the original show, 21 years ago, almost 22 years ago. Wow. And I had never done an, uh, an animated series audition in my life. And they showed me a picture of Beast Boy and the script and the character description, class clown and et cetera. And then out came this voice, yo. And I never, ever, ever did that, you know, the voice before. He was inside of me ready to be birthed. And uh, a couple months later, I was shooting a movie uh, called Club Dread in Mexico. And I got a call while I was down there. Like, you got the role of Beast Boy in Teen Titans, and it's, it's a big deal. And I was like, okay, cool. I had no clue what, what it really meant. How did you find out about the casting call? My agent. They let me actually, before that audition, they would put me in, like, a, a little booth because I knew how to run, like, basic recording equipment. So it, I'd take, like, four hours to, like, work on a McDonald's audition before they submitted it. Wow. <laughs> and then eventually they're like, you want to go to a cartoon audition at Warner Brothers, and I said, of course. So you went to the actual Warner Brothers lot for the audition? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I've been to that studio a lot. It's uh, astonishing yeah, at the it's setup. Fun. And it's like the OG of studios, you know? It's been yeah. there for a long time. I shot the middle there, the show of the middle for years. So, yeah. So fun. Yeah, I remember that show for sure. Um, but going back to Teen Titans, I remember my brother would watch that show yeah. on Cartoon Network. I helped and raise you. Yeah, definitely. I remember your character for sure. I was like, oh my gosh, you're the guy. That's yeah. so exciting. Yeah, yeah, I got to create him in a lot of ways. He's, How so? He's me. There was basic, um, basic things about him that were created in the comic book, but, but as I started to bring him to life, he became me. I made him a vegetarian and then a vegan. As I became a vegan, Beast Boy became a vegan. Um, he's a musician because of me. Uh, his relationship with Raven is because of me and Tara Strong d developing that ship. And um, he's, very, he's very much me. So all the incarnations of Beast Boy are because of the, cl the collaboration of me and him coming together. That's wild. Yeah. So tell me about the relationship from your perspective of Raven and Beast Boy. Like... Yeah. Well, my best friend is Tara Strong. She plays Raven, and she has been for 22 years, like like me, playing Beast Boy. And she's my best friend, and um, we just love each other so much that so we kind of started to pretend like we we're in love in a different way on the show, just to be playful. It's better that way. Yeah, that's so <laughs> if awesome. Yeah, if you want to remain friends, it's better to never have... Have sex. And, well, and professional but reasons too. Or, or not, or it could work out. I don't know. You know Everything is possible. In an alternate universe, it's working out. Exactly. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. So, Maybe some, it doesn't. Sometimes Raven's not very nice to be spoiled. I know. <laughs> She's a trickster in that sense. Yeah, that, that show, that cartoon is kind of beautiful in a way like the characters they all have a certain look mm -hmm. you know they're all kind of different mm -hmm. can you talk about why Beast Boy is green yes Beast Boy is green because um, the experiment that turned him into a changeling basically changed the color of his skin but I feel like he's green for a much deeper reason because he's the color of the heart chakra mm. and the heart chakra is um very important to his characteristics because he's basically a walking heart. Especially in the original Teen Titans show, he was much more innocent, and I played him. I was much more innocent, I suppose, as well. So he, Beast Boy in the original Teen Titans was very innocent, whereas now in Teen Titans Go, I'm a much more cynical. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I love that explanation, the heart chakra. Um, that is so interesting. And just looking back at that job, like that was your biggest job at that point, mm -hmm. like in voiceover acting. And you never really thought, it sounds like, that you would go into voiceover work. I mean, I, I grew up in Disney World. Growing up in Florida, my dad would um, drive our, my nine brothers and sisters around the United States. 
He wants to dance on the table so That's bad. okay. Yeah. Or he wants your coffee. So you had nine brothers and sisters? Yeah, and he would basically drop us all off at Disney World and let us, like, be free all day. He'd be like, Come, meet me at 10 o'clock p.m. So we'd be free all day long. And Mickey Mouse and those characters really influenced me a lot. He's a coffeeaholic. Oh, my God. <laughs> we gotta get him his own coffee. We should give him some coffee. Yeah, sure. You're down for that? Yeah. Okay. He Is... loves coffee, and oh he. Oh my! He... <laughs> I've never seen a dog drink coffee before. <laughs> he's gonna be bouncing off the walls. No, or maybe he's an no, addict and it doesn't t- it phase doesn't, him anymore. <laughs> you, you won't know the difference. He's always chill. He's a he's a man dog, but he's in every recording session, every business meeting. Every every Comic Con we fly around the world. He's been in a, he's been on over a hundred flights. Probably. Wow. He's in Teen Titans Go. He's in Young Justice. He's got his own comic books and plushy toys. And basically, I'm um, I work for him. Mm. So basically, what I'm doing now is bringing to to reality his religion, which is the science of dog consciousness. The science of dog consciousness is basically. The pure you serve dog, the pure the universe will serve you. Mm. And it works. It's like results based. So you could just try it. I I I believe in that too. Yeah. I have a dog myself and I love my dog so much. Yeah, they're the nectar of the universe. Yeah. They're You're just the nectar like of the universe. Pure love, you know? Pure love. Yes. Oh, and he speaks with his kisses. Oh, so does my dog. Yeah. He loves kisses. Oh, so is he like a chihuahua? He's a king chihuahua. Oh, wow. <laughs> He's a king chihuahua. He's trying to get you. you like my coffee? He did. Thanks for sharing with You're him. You're welcome. Dude. <laughs> he wants more. <laughs> I'm okay with it. I have plenty of coffee. <laughs> if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. What was in it? Was it a straight? Uh, no, it's got a little bit of <laughs> cream. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Cool. So, um, as he's helping himself to, he's the real life beast boy. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. I see it. Um, So, it's to my understanding you were Michelangelo as well, Mm and Ninja Turtle. Yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Yeah, I'm a Ninja Turtle, and for me that that was one of the greatest gifts I've ever received as well as playing Michelangelo because the Ninja Turtles were my favorite cartoon. Yeah, like the old school cartoon. Yeah, I, gr- I grew up watching the Ninja Turtles, and Michelangelo was always my favorite turtle. I would have Ninja Turtle birthday parties and at the roller skating ring and pe- you know pizza parties, and for Halloween I'd dress up as a Ninja Turtle, always Mikey. So now, now to be Mikey is so like like a dream, like I'm dreaming awake. In re- in in reality, this in my opinion. That's what life is, is like you go from dream to dream to dream. So like right now, while I'm with you, this is like a dream where I'm, I'm awake and I'm conscious. Like when I go to bed, I'm, I'm dreaming, but I'm not, as awake. I'm not as awake. It's harder to be present in your dreams yeah. in a way. But I think that changes as well. The more I'm conscious and aware in this reality, the more I'm conscious in the, all the dream states, which is really wild. And he's in every one of my dreams. No way. 90% of the time, which yeah. is wild. So you're his sidekick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you like that coffee, Buddha? Oh, yes. Yeah, that was yummy. I remember uh, the Ninja Turtles, and like every boy I knew had like the Ninja Turtle like comforters and mm-hmm. stuff like that, like sheets. You know, that was the thing. Merch. Yeah. Billions of dollars of merchandise sold. Insane. Actually, when our show was launched on Nickelodeon, um, TMNT, our version of the show became worth more than Nickelodeon itself. What? I did not know this. Yeah, we sold a toy every 16 seconds for years. So it was was bigger than the original show as well. That's mind-blowing. Mm, they should have never stopped making it. I agree. Yeah. If it's that successful. Yeah, and when they tried to do the next one, it only lasted a season and a half. Really? Uh, yeah. So mistakes happen, and eventually uh, this show will come back as the best ones always do. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. They're always remaking something in yeah. Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, my my TMNT show at this point is the the legacy version, which is a, such a blessing. The legacy version. Meaning it's the one the most iconic, the most um recognized out of all of them. Yeah, especially in this generation, mm -hmm. like that was the most recent. And it's the best looking one in my opinion. Oh it yeah. It really is. My friend Ciro Nieli designed all the characters and executive produced the show and he's like as far as like famous Italian artists, like the names of the turtles, like Leonardo and Michelangelo and da, you know, um, Raphael and Da Vinci, et cetera, et cetera. Ciro Nieli is an Italian artist that makes cartoons, he, and he's the best. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so interesting that they chose the name Michelangelo for your character. <laughs> <laughs> My middle name is Mikey. No way, this is so meta. Mm -hmm. Talk about dream state, living in the dream state, you know. Mm -hmm. You are definitely creating your own reality, it seems we like. We are. And you can always basically change your reality. Anytime you want to just do something else, just do it. Don't think about it, just do it. And then the universe responds. I agree. Like, just take the steps towards that goal, whatever steps. it may be. Yeah. Yeah. You walk towards it, and then it unfolds mm -hmm. for you. So fun. Yeah. As long as you have a good intention behind it, I feel like it will just unfold yes. in a way that you could have never imagined. Better than you could have imagined exactly. every time. Yeah. You'll get everything you've ever wanted, and you'll receive it in a way you never could have imagined. Better than you could have imagined every time. Well said. I, I live my life that way, too. And... On that note, you know, you're like following your passion in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Does this feel like what you were meant to do in this version of yourself? Yeah, I feel like at this point now more than ever before, I, I understand my dharma, which means my purpose. Dharma means purpose or you're like what you're supposed to do while, while you're on this planet in these bodies. And right now it's serving him and I take shelter under his lotus feet and I'm bringing the message of dog consciousness to the world through all the cartoons that I'm making, through everything that I make, I try to infuse his message or all dogs' messages to be pure love, to be all the greatest qualities in the universe, which are, which he, he is, which is patience, compassion, loyalty, beauty, innocence, rascality, playfulness, on and on and on. And then you become your association. Mm -hmm. So, like, I figured it out. Yeah. So what to you like is your creative passion like well i'm unlimited <laughs> excuse me every day i'm making music cartoons live action shows writing movies and uh you know surfing and number one though i'm i'm serving and taking care of him of him making sure he's always happy mm -hmm. satisfied having the best life he could ever have because then the universe does the same for me yeah yeah, when you take care of others or other beings, you know, you are taken care of too. Yeah, yeah he's teaching me to, lo to love everybody and everything the way I love him. Mm. I feel like humans for me are the hardest to love because we're so imperfect. I'm not perfect, he is, but he's teaching me to be able to love everybody the way I love him. So he's Aww. making me a better human. That's so sweet. Yeah. That's what they do for us. The greatest gift you could ever give yourself is a dog. Or a cat, best. or any animal, but really, dogs, I feel, are specifically designed for us to learn the easiest from how to love. I mean, it makes sense, dog, God, God, dog. And oh, I, yes. I don't believe in God. It's God backwards. You don't yeah. need to believe in God, because God is here. Dog is here. You don't need to believe. It's, like, real. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. Yeah. Going back to this realm, <laughs> I'm curious... How do you work with directors when you're a voiceover actor? Like, are you recording your own and then you send it to the editing room? Or how does that all work out with the um, collaboration? Every project is different. Um, a lot of times there's a director and the whole cast might be also there in person or we're all virtually together through the technology these days. It's very easy. and um, But sometimes... I'll get a script and they're just like record it and send it to us. Mm. Mm. So you record at your own studio? Yeah. I don't leave Venice. This is actually as far as I've come 
east in a long time. Wow. I got rid of my car two years ago because my recording booth is in my living room on the Venice Beach boardwalk. And I don't have to go anywhere past uh, east of Lincoln. <laughs> this is, I don't go east of Lincoln, so you got me here. <laughs> well, thank you so much yeah. for going a I, little bit of ways away from this, Lincoln. This is far. Um, I go to New York more than I go east of Lincoln. No way. I don't go um, south of Washington, north of Rose, or east of Lincoln, ever. Actually, I really don't go east of Abbe Kenny. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> That's so funny. The Californians would know <laughs> what he is talking about. I certainly know. I will say, like, I stay in the same radius myself. Like, I hang around, like, Marina Del Rey or, like, driving over to Abikini in that vicinity. Yeah. I don't really leave this area either as much. And people always talk about, like, how crazy traffic is, but I'm so fortunate that I don't have to yeah. drive in the crazy traffic as much. And same to you. It I used like... to have to, though, and it was yeah. torture. Although the jobs that I, w I was doing were very fun, all the cartoons and whatever TV shows or whatever I was doing that was in the valley was worth it. the drive. I would still feel tortured driving there. I'd be like, oh, this is just oppressive traffic and the pollution. And basically, I think LA is pretty ugly most places other, yeah. than, other than Venice Beach and certain parts of Hollywood and certain parts of downtown, but little pieces and other places too. I'm not just saying uh, LA is ugly. But you really have to search for it. But Venice is fucking beautiful. I love Venice. Nature, humanity. It's the Wild West. I mean, you could die because it's fucking dangerous. It's but, wild out there. But if People you keep are your wild. eyes open, I call it ninja training ground. <laughs> You're really, a ninja in real life? Truly. I live on the boardwalk. You can imagine I live with humanity. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen everything you could ever imagine. And a lot of stuff I, you probably, I wish I could unsee, but... Nonetheless, mm. I've seen it all. And what, what the boardwalk has showed, shown me, living on the boardwalk for 10 years now, 22 years in Venice, it's shown me that humanity is actually good, not bad, mm. by a huge majority, like 90%. If we were left alone, like Venice Beach, where freedom exists more than any other place, humanity would be harmonious I and think beautiful. so, too. We have to fire every politician, mm. every Republican, every Democrat get back to independence and the things that matter in the Constitution and use mm -hmm. technology to help us move forward and give the power to the voter, the power to choose where your tax dollars go and the power to vote for yourself. Representative government is a dead system and it's a scam and we don't need it anymore. It was designed back when there was no transportation or technology where you'd need somebody to go represent your village, go all the way to Washington, D.C. and say, I'm representing these people in Arizona or whatever. We don't need that bullshit anymore. They're all corrupt and self-serving, so fire them all. I, we need a new plan, and that's part of it. I know. I, I think going back to uh, you know our Constitution, I think, is a really good roadmap for moral value. And I feel like in today's society, in today's world, we do have different problems than what they did when they wrote the Constitution. But... On a moral value, uh, I think the Constitution is a good roadmap moving forward in this technology-based, it's kind of a technocracy right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, mm -hmm. I hear you on all that. It's the, crazy. The, the reason why I bring it up as well is the way out of the mess we're in, where politicians from both sides this, of this duopoly are destroying Earth by selling out for profit the war machine making all the profit, the pharmaceutical industry making all the profit, etc., while people suffer and die. Um, the way out of it is with creativity and mm -hmm. infusing tools and solutions, embedding it within creativity so people can actually enjoy consuming it and learning from it. Yeah, I like mean... Like a podcast like this, that's why I, just, I said yes to you. come to this. I had no clue what, what, <laughs> where I was coming today, who you were. No. But I just, I just say yes when it feels right. So. Oh, thank you. And I say yes to infusing everything with my intent, and my intent is pure. Yeah, same here. I create from my heart, you know, and whenever I'm creating a project in VR, I'm creating from a place of love and, uh, you know, spreading a message that I believe in and that I think has good moral value to it and intention mm -hmm. while also entertaining. 
and and creating something beautiful with uh, other people mm -hmm. and i think that's what inspires me the most yeah. is that collaboration that co effort you know i do like yesterday i shot a, a movie with some friends in venice beach nice. we kind of Three days before, we're like, we're gonna make a movie, and then three days later, we sh shot a movie in one day. Uh, me and yeah. my friend Caleb Simpson and a couple other really cool people, we just had an experiment, and um, being together with as many, the more people, the more fun in a lot of ways, as far as creativity goes, because that's where the magic and miracles happen when we come together and uh, experience creativity together, especially when it's intentful. And again, with him around. All I ever have to do is just focus on him. If I'm in stress, anxiety, um, <laughs> it's because I'm not paying attention to him. Oh, honey. <laughs> My honey. dog does the same honey, thing. Honey, honey. Wants the pet. Um, yeah, it's like when you are collaborating with someone, they come up with something that you never would have even thought of. Yeah, exactly. And it makes it so much better than what you could even imagine. And that's why I love Venice, because every kind of person in the whole universe exists there it makes it it's like ah uh, it's, it's the most visceral place on earth it's the true united nations of the world and it's, it's just amazing so and it keeps venice, getting better yeah venice have you ever looked into the history of venice i know a lot what what kind of takeaways some quick takeaways uh, about the history because you probably know more about the history than i do but i find well, it fascinating Abbott Kenny, who developed Venice Beach, California, which was actually called uh, Venice of America, it was, was its own city, and he chose to develop it over Santa Monica. He had the option to, to, to basically own Santa Monica, which at the time was also a richer place, more developed, yeah. or take this area called Venice, which actually at the time was called duck hunting land. It was, like, it was just like marsh. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's like, I want that. Basically, he wanted on a, co a coin toss the ability to choose between both. Uh -huh. And um, he chose to create Venice of America. And he was also a very complicated, very integrated man within the government and banking systems as well. But he was a guy who sneakily was uh, a very powerful visionary for creating a heaven on earth. He didn't really let, you know, like... He was rebellious, and he basically created Venice Beach as this mecca for creativity and enjoyment and harmony and beauty, and um, that attracted a lot of artists and diversity, as it does still today. And um, he made heaven on earth, and basically, when he moved on, um, which there's more details to explore with that, like the city of Los Angeles actually bought Venice Beach I didn't know that. And they filled his Venice canals, which were beautiful and very mm -hmm. much like Venice, Italy. They filled them with concrete, chopped his buildings down, just basically tried to destroy Venice Beach to get rid of the beatniks and the colored people and the, the people living here by chopping the buildings down and saying, oh, yeah. you have nowhere to live, get out of here. Mm -hmm. um, but they couldn't kill Venice, and Venice is actually going through a renaissance right now, coming back to life, and his vision is still alive. It's so alive, and that's what intrigues me so much about mm. Venice, mm. is that I, it was so potent. When I first moved to um, LA, I moved to Hollywood Hills, and I found myself going to Venice mm -hmm. every week, almost every other day. I get it. And I was just addictive. drawn to the people. It felt so real, whereas Hollywood doesn't feel as real. It feels really kind of fake, you know? It's disjointed. Yeah. There was a time where Hollywood was much more integrated and more fun and uh, magical. And there's, there are still parts like that, but most of it has been stamped out by yuppies and you know fake woke people and like all the rest of the bullshit that occurs up there. Mm -hmm. And they don't talk to each other. It's like neighbors don't talk to each other. They don't even hang out in front of their house or outside even. And you also have to drive everywhere, whereas in Venice... You can walk everywhere and meet everybody and neighbors talk to each other. It's the only real community I know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. as long as you're not hurting anybody, everybody coexists no matter who you are. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love Venice. I was so drawn to it, and it's so fascinating, the history. A lot of people don't know about the history, but I, I thought it was so beautiful, the, the first vision, you know, of creating the Venice in, in America, mm -hmm. uh, uh, inspired by Venice, Italy, and having those canals, and at least, luckily, we still have a couple left, and they're yeah. just so beautiful. I'll walk over there and... And they used to have like rides and the circus oh, was there epic, and all of that. Epic. Yeah. And that stuff can come back. I'm actually creating a project right now that shows people how to get it back. And basically, I'm going to show people how to secede from the city of Los Angeles <laughs> and create, you know, the United States of Venice essentially is what we want. We want all of the world and all of America to become more like Venice Beach. I mean, it is very inspiring and i was always drawn to it there's just something about it you know freedom Where you feel that vibe free it's very potent it's one of the last free places on earth venice beach and that's attractive and magnetic and uh, addictive yeah totally. freedom is is one of the most precious things you can ever give yourself maybe the most precious thing you could ever give yourself next to having a dog mm -hmm. dog's number one though the greatest gift you could ever give yourself so if there was a project that you're most proud of, what would that be? Or are you proud of all of them? Yeah, I'm grateful for all of the projects I've been a part of and proud of them all. And especially the ones that I've played for longer periods of time where I get to really develop the character. Because that's the most fun is when you get to develop a character and be, live with that character and really that character becomes you because you can't separate the two. Yeah, yeah. And the, the voices are so succinct, uh, distinct <laughs> in your creative process. Like, tell me more about, like, that creative process of creating that vo different voices for different characters. Well, I mean, uh, you have to be an actor. You have to know how to act. And there's not one way to act, but you should definitely ex try to explore all styles and all tools that you could find to, to play with as far as acting goes. And, um, and then to be playful and fearless and try new things and to take care of yourself because your body is your, your tool, your body is your vehicle, your body is your money maker. And if you're sick, you're not gonna be able to act. If, you're, you, know, if you feel crappy, it's gonna come across on camera, et cetera. So you have to be, learn to take care of yourself and to be fearless. Oh, that's amazing advice for anyone who's interested in getting into voiceover acting. Yeah, and also, when it comes to acting, you want to be able to understand people's pers other people's perspectives. Therefore, being able to play them uh, truthfully would require you understanding the homeless man on the side of the street, what his life may be like. Like You have to kind of go to the pits of hell and experience them one way or the other to be able to be a great actor. To be able to see the, the highest of heavens, you have to understand the, the, the pits of hell, essentially, to be able to choose where you want to go and to be able to derive as much truthful experience that you can actually bring to the character you're developing. Um, the more experience you have, the better as far as acting goes. How did you go through that, the, the depths of hell and the oh, heavens, you know, like from your personal experience? It's still happening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. always happening. It's always happening. Death teaches you a lot. I, I, I've had so many great friends move on, which is devastating, but you learn so much from death, but then you also learn um, how to live life fully and, and with gratitude and to not miss a second because it's all so precious. And I think in that present, in that preciousness, is the highest peaks of heaven. Yeah, being fully present in the experience. That's the present. That's the gift. And he brings me to that. So I, my, the highest peaks of heaven are just being with him. I actually have a, um, I have a hard time doing anything else these days. All I want to do is look at his face. Aww, yeah. you're just so in love with your dog. I love him so much. He's the happiest boy in the whole world. So you know, amazing. Boy in the whole world, good with you. Animals. Everybody knows it. Animals are amazing. Everybody knows it. Yeah. It's so undeniable your love for your dog. And I'm making a documentary which kind of goes out to, really? to my socials and 
I guess the subscription only people on Instagram can watch my documentary every week, new episodes of that, that. But it's basically like the behind the scenes, the real, real daily experience with Wingman, which, you know, like this, whether we're coming to a podcast or hanging out in Venice from the moment I wake up to the moment we go to bed, it's all about him. That's amazing that you're doing that, yeah. and it's to my understanding that you also are helping other dogs find a home. Is, yeah. is that correct? Like, what kind of organizations are you working with? On well, that? I've created, a, it's called Dog Blessed, and basically it's a, a foundation where, from the sales of Wingman's comic books and his plushy toys and his roles on TV, etc., we use the money. <laughs> To pay for adoption fees for those people that need the help. We pay for the dog food for the, the dogs. And we pay the human to take care of the dogs. Your only job would be to take care of the dogs. So we're creating a, a, a foundation that will support that kind of lifestyle for the human and the dog to benefit by working together. That's awesome. Yeah. And so is this like a nonprofit that you started? Yeah, it's, I'm still developing it, but essentially that's the concept and, and it, it means a lot to me. Yeah, I can And tell. we're already feeding dogs. We're already paying for adoption fees. Those, those are the easy things. But paying a human to just take care of the dog is the next step. Oh, that's like cool. Like as your job. So it's a job taking care of that the you're dog on, and you're getting paid for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That is interesting. I never even thought about that before. Yeah, and I feel like our tax dollars could easily support that scenario, especially as robots take over all the jobs. Oh, gosh. Your job can be to take care of dogs, and it should be a human right for every human to be able to have a dog a, a companion, teacher, guru. Like, there should be, never be a place that says you're not allowed to have a dog. Every apartment, dog, there's no such thing as not dog-friendly. I know, that's the thing. Like, That'll was, be in the new constitution. I was looking into like hotels that allow dogs, and it's like few and far between. I feel like you could find more in Airbnbs and stuff, but hotels, good luck. We're never apart. Yeah. Ever, ever. I, I won't go anywhere where he's not completely welcome, and I go to the places where he's treated like a king, which are the best places anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Mm. Well, I, I'm curious to hear more about your work in um, animal rights and things like that. That's so exciting. I've actually worked with um, folks like PETA on VR projects for them, mm -hmm. and that's been really rewarding. And it's, it's really amazing to be part of an organization that really um, gives a voice to animals which don't actually have a say in the matter of their own lives, you know? Yeah, being a voice for the voiceless is yeah. critical. And I feel like as, as we evolve as humans, as we start to get into a heart space more and realize that we're all one, people will start having more compassion and understanding for the suffering and the violence that occurs with the demonic meat industry and the demonic dairy industry. Because dairy is liquid meat and you should definitely get off of it. It's very addictive. It takes a little bit of time to get off of it. If you clean out your stomach, you won't be you know, you won't have those moments where you're like, "Oh, I got to have some blood and pus dairy cheese or milk." It won't be a part of your that's not food. Neither is dead rotting animal. It's poison. So eventually people like naturally go towards a plant-based diet just cuz they're in their heart space and they're going to feel better. You're going to be healthier, happier, and holier. And that's where it's all going. I think animals will eventually be liberated for the most part. There's always going to be some killers. There's going to be some meat eaters, and that's fine. You can accept everybody. But essentially, humanity will probably want to become like you know 95% vegans, which is amazing. Um, so animals will be liberated. And then I feel like children should be liberated next. Children are... I mean, they should be liberated right now. What I mean by liberated is... They're the masters. Children are the gurus. Wingman is the same as a child. And ch children are the same as wingman. They're God in pure presence. So if we listen to kids more, we'd be living in a heavenly world. I agree. I know. And they should have the, the same rights as anybody has to, st to put their input. Once they could talk, that's it. They can vote on whatever the fuck they want to vote on. They can say what they want to do. They're, they're full humans. They're not less than human. I don't think so. Children are treated less than human, like slaves. I don't like that. 
like animals are treated like slaves. Children are, um, they're the gurus, they're the masters. They're just kind of seen as lesser than, in a way. Until they're adults, which means, a, did you know, look it up, D-U-L-T means dummy. So a doll really? means a dummy. So until they want, it's all, it's all a scam. There's a lot of ghosts in the English language. Well, it's just like spell. It's like a word. It, yeah. Words are spells. like spells. You know? They are spells. Yeah. Spelling is spells. Mm -hmm. And essentially, there's ghosts in the English language to imprison us in, you know, a slave language is essentially what it is. Yeah. So English is, yeah. yeah. That's, That's a deep, deep conversation. Yeah. But I want to go back to some of the questions that I ask everyone when I interview. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to know where creativity comes from. Where do you think cre creativity comes from? Like, to create that, in that desire to create. The, it's the closest you can get to God is creativity. Um, having a dog in your lap is having God in your lap. But if you want to get as, you know, as close as you can to God, have a dog and be creative. But creativity really, when you're being creative, that's what God is, is creativity and creation. Yeah, I agree. Of, of the, everything, everything is God. Everything is, is one, the good and the bad. It's an infinite spectrum of dark and light. So again, um, being conscious of what you're creating gives you the ability, the ability to have the most fun. Yeah, and another question I have for you is, do you believe in the aspect of, like, a muse? A lot of people, you know, they feel like they're tapping into something that they can't necessarily explain, but it comes through them, and they're just, like, the conduit. Do you feel like you've felt that before, like that muse feeling? I feel it all the time, and I'm so grateful for it. Anytime I'm, like, questioning anything, the universe goes, no, dude, you got stuff to do. And I'm like, wow, thank you so much. It reels you back into on that path. Yeah, I just know everything's going to be all right. And just like Bob Marley says, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> and I don't know exactly how the song goes. But <laughs> actually, I wrote a song like that with a lyric like that. Everything's going to be all right. Sat back and closed my eyes and found a reason why. I chose to fly. Some things just got to change. It's all inside my brain. Don't need a damn thing. Oh, that's awesome. Except dog and being creative. <laughs> that's all you need and <laughs> is a dog. And be creative. He's your muse. And women. I'm a goddess worshiper. Okay. <laughs> that's good, too. We need those in our lives as well. Women. Dog's right, number women. one. And then <laughs> oh, my God. Then God. Women come second? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that's how you are with your dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah, my, my dog, dog comes, comes first, then no doubt. Men. Then men. <laughs> yeah, then men. That's how you stay uh, happy, healthy. Yeah, having a balanced life. Um, so what is the meaning to you uh, of being an artist? The meaning to me is to be able to basically... Um, what people hear and see is how their minds work, which therefore creates our reality. So for me as an artist, as a creator, I'm, I'm shaping what... Not, not only um, the reality that I exist in, but millions of others. And it's a great responsibility. I feel like most entertainers don't understand mm -hmm. the opportunity at hand, especially the biggest of celebrities. Mm -hmm. What a waste. They have all this attention, and they just continue to... Not all of them. There's people doing things, but for the most part, a lot of celebrities are not utilizing the, the great opportunity to, to heal the planet. That's why I loved artists like Michael Jackson or Prince or Bob Marley or these great people that have taken their celebrity one way or the other and you know done good with it and served the people with the opportunity. Unapologetically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like those Like John uh, Lennon, they get, you get killed for it. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. Oh my god. Yeah, that's, that's insane. insane. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, being an artist, not being afraid to really uh, sit in your truths as an artist and being able to express yourself and people really gravitate towards that. But going on that edge, 
you know, and leaping off the edge into um, sharing your creativity is very vulnerable, you know? Yeah, I love it so much. Yeah. And again, as long as I'm like connected to my source, which is in my lap right now, Buddha, Wingmanji, I'm always going to be right and I get to say all the right things. I don't have to ever think. Like thinking is has gone. Like I basically have an empty like vessel and divine inspiration and communication just comes through. Yeah. Yeah, it just comes through through the the source. Uh do you think that anyone can be an artist? Whether you like it or not, and I suggest you like it. <laughs> You are arting. Everybody, everybody's creating their life, and that's artistry. So it's you know you have no like. It's you doing it. So like make a change if you want to change it. Create a different kind of art in your life. Art a different way. How art thou? Art however the fuck you want to art, because it works. Like you said earlier, step by step by step, and all, then all of a sudden you're there. And you're going to get in a way in a way you never could have imagined, better than you could have imagined every time. But you have to take the steps. You can't just think about it. I think about stuff too much. I know. <laughs> I'm right there on the same wavelength. Honestly, I think about this stuff all the time. I'm not perfect, but he is. But again, as, a, as a, somebody who likes to create the reality they live in, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at it. But I feel like I can be better, and I think that's what keeps me going is the fact that I want to be a better artist. Yeah, and, you know, it's just so empowering to really fully understand, like, you're creating your own reality. And not a lot of people really let that sink in, but you have the power to choose what reality you want to live in. Yeah, there's, there's it's never um, cut and dry simple like that's how it is there's there's like a, there's pain involved you're going to learn a lot from the trials and tribulations and the growing pains that will come with creating a new reality for you to exist in yeah we're all on this hero's journey you're the hero of your story you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. and having that realization is so uh empowering yeah it's yeah you're the director you're the writer you're the star you're actually the lighting person everything everything and you can see everyone within you're, you and you know? you're catering so make sure you're eating the right stuff because you become your association so if you're eating trash you're gonna attract trash exactly you're gonna feel like trash so you know eat correctly drink healthy spring water spend your money on water and food and you'll save that in hospital bills later a hundred percent Taking care of this vessel is key. You know? Sure, and getting back to your roots too. Like, don't forget where you you came from. I'm actually starting to find that my original accent is more comfortable than whatever my accent became since living in really? California. It's really weird. Did you have like a southern accent? <laughs> I guess I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm from the Everglades, and I grew up in the Georgia mountains camping. So there's a subtle like southern draw to my 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 most natural speaking. For some reason, I guess I got rid of it based on being an actor, and it, now I'm like letting it come back, and it's so it's such such a weird feeling. But it's naturally making me be able to speak easier, having my southern draw. It's really fucking weird. <laughs> I like it though. When did you realize that? Recently. <laughs> really. I'm from North Carolina too, so yeah. I have a, a well, little of it. I think some of my favorite parts that I've ever played on TV have been westerns. Like I was in Deadwood, me and Kristen Bell were in Deadwood together, and nice. I had a great role, and I got to use my southern accent. But I grew up riding horses, and I grew up on a little farm kind of thing, and um, gr growing up in the Everglades and camp. And again, I'm from the South, so that, like the fact that it wouldn't be there it wouldn't even make sense. It wouldn't be there? What do you mean? If I didn't have the accent. Oh, right. But I, I'm so entrenched in surf, skate culture, and also, you know, listening to Bob Marley and reggae music being my number one favorite music my whole life. I've got a little bit of Jamaican accent, too. <laughs> it just comes, you know? I think it's, it's all there, but in my southern draw is something that's starting to resurface, which is really interesting. When was the last time you went to the South? I go to Florida every couple of months. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. 
so it probably comes out a little bit that way. I just went back home for the holidays. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I travel a lot because we're on this Comic Con tour every year. So we go to all the cities around America. So I go to the, I go everywhere. We go everywhere. Every every month we go somewhere new. Usually at least one place. Yeah, Comic Cons are fun. I haven't been to one yet, but I hope to go to one soon. You know? Yeah, that'd be really amazing. It's really fun. Yeah, I saw. I think I saw pictures of you at Comic Con. Like people, do people recognize you at Comic Con? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a different kind of experience. Although, now recently with certain like social media videos that have reached a lot of people, now I'm being recognized more and more and more, which is pretty wild. In your daily life. Yeah, like I I basically live. In Comic Con, being on the boardwalk now, people know where I live, and they're all such sweet fans. Like, I'm not complaining. I love these people that come up to me, and they're they're so sweet. And they can I get a picture or whatever, maybe. And it's not overbearing. Everybody's so respectful. It's beautiful. But I feel like I live in Comic Con now, which is cool. There's always been the random person that recognized me for all all the things I've been in, but now because of the Twitter, or not Twitter, TikTok, being a TikTok. Star. TikTok famous. <laughs> People recognize me. I love TikTok. <laughs> I know, I like it too. I'm, I'm addicted to this thing. I, I am. And I, I know, it's this I little to, magic box. I know, I keep looking and then commun- it's a really powerful communication device. TikTok is fun. It's cool. It's very powerful. To, I love going live. Yeah, you guys should check out his lives. Where can they find you on TikTok? We live right now. Where, where can they find you on TikTok? Uh, just my name. You can find me everywhere. At Greg Sipes. G-R-E-G-C-I-P-E-S. Everywhere on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. What's next for you creatively? Like, what are you working on next? Mm, that I, you can talk about? I never stop. I'm, I'm infinitely inspired. I've probably got like... 20 cartoons in development, um, a couple movies that I want to make, live action movies, um, birthing the science of dog consciousness, you know, as far as like, I don't want to say religion, because it's got such a bad connotation, religion is so like, pe- people have killed each other in the name of religion more than any other thing, so like, it's not a religion, but it is a science, if you want, a science to finding the God within yourself by serving dogs. So I've got all these like books and comic books and kids, children's books and just more stuff about how, how my experience with Wingman G every day is bringing me to a place of um, bliss. And it's so easy because all you gotta do is go adopt a dog and it's basically free. You know, the bliss is free. The bliss is free. And dogs need homes. They, they're killing them every day because they don't have homes. And that's why I feel like even the Uber driver that drove me here today, because, again, this is as far as I go. I, this is, nonetheless, I'm so happy to be here because I get to share all this. The driver today, he's like, oh, man, the apartment that I live in won't let me have a dog. And I think that should be illegal. Every, every human should be, have the right to have a dog. And then there wouldn't be dogs in the pound being killed every day because... They'd be at home with the human being that wants them to be there. Yeah. It'd be like, I mean, it would cut the, the, the population at the pounds where they're being killed by like 90% for sure. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah there's so many apartment buildings in L.A. It's a human right. And, you, you know, there can be training involved and, you know, apartment buildings can be built a special way where there's a certain pee and poop area, et cetera. Like, you just design things differently. Yeah, I mean, dog is man's best friend. We've been hanging out together for centuries, Mm -hmm. thousands of years. And to deny us of that joy, that bliss that you're speaking of is cruel. Yeah, so I'm I'm most excited about continuing to be his servant and birthing what he wants me to birth as far as creatively, you know, wrapping the science of dog consciousness within, um, you know, a, a palatable experience for people to get to it and don't waste time i tell people if you're thinking about adopting a dog or getting a dog just just go do it it's the greatest gift you could ever give yourself 100 percent. and the world would be a better place if ever if everybody had a dog i and that's what we want we want the world to be a better place yeah have that little guy that little friend yeah 
bring them everywhere. Yeah. What are any last thoughts you want to leave uh, viewers? Hmm. Let's see. Well, first and foremost, you know, dog bless you all. Thank you for watching and being here with us today. This was very fun. <laughs> I'm grateful for everybody, especially my guru here. I take shelter under his lotus feet. Um, om, om war, om, om with the om, let's do three of them, om, om, one more extra one for the people at home, do it with us. Oh. Feels so good. Just three ohms, four ohms. We did four. It creates um, new neural pathways, heals your nervous system, and it connects us all together. So, all more. That's my message. Beautiful. Thank you so <laughs> much, Greg, for coming. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you so much. You got the force. Give me. For watching my name is Keely Turner don't forget to subscribe hit that like button bell button you know the jazz every youtuber says that uh, and I will see you in the metaverse